On This Week in Enterprise Tech, we find out who's behind Mr. Robot. Mubix comes on to show us a, an attack on both Macs and PCs that gives attackers access to your network credentials. And VMware shows us the future of containers. Hint, it's inside of a VM. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 207, recorded September 16th, 2016. Mubix penetrates, VMware secures. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet that you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. Welcome to Twyatt. This week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you by myself. I've got my regular cast of characters, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's the host of Information Week Radio. Curtis, how are things over on the opposite coast? Padre, we're um, in the middle of fall, so we've got things in the cool, crisp 80s here in uh, Florida. Football teams are playing everywhere. It's a great day to be here on Twyatt. Uh, now, Curtis, are you broadcasting from inside a phone booth? Because this is not your regular background. It is not my uh, my regular appearance. What's happening is that, uh, well, we've got some renovation going on here at the Swamp Studio. So I'm in a uh, different part of the house. And uh, it, it looks a little bit different, I suppose. You should have just said that you were coming from an undisclosed location for security reasons, but okay, we'll we'll pass on that one. Also joining us is Mr. Lou Maresca. He's a senior lead developer over at Microsoft in their fabulous CRM Dynamics division. Lou, how are things up in the uh, great state of Microsoft? Yeah, doing fantastic. Uh, doing a bunch of DevOps today and deployment and uh, Azure service fabric, all this fun stuff today. Well, gentlemen, we've got a full plate planned for our audience today. Not only will we be doing our regular blips, but we've also got an interview with Rob Fuller, who is the man who discovered that wonderfully, fantastically easy-to-do USB armory attack for cred credentials on both Mac and PC. And we're also going to be joined by Guido Appenzeller. He is the Chief Technology Strategy Officer over at VMware. So if you want to know about security or about virtualization, this is your next hour. But first, let's go ahead and kick it off with the blips. And guess what? The FCC is getting a mulligan on their Spectrum auction. This past Tuesday, the Federal Communications Commission took a second crack at a reverse auction for the first 126 megahertz block of RF real estate in the Spectrum auction. The first round fell short after the Stage 1 silent auction failed to clear the $86 billion target set by the FCC. This new round of auctions will include 114 megahertz, two fewer UHF channels than stage one. The auction has been criticized for being unnecessarily complicated with silent auctions and unfreezing of spectrum replacing the forward auction format that the FCC had previously used. Under the established rules, the FCC has 52 total rounds to clear out the spectrum, which would require bidders to bid at a hidden reserve price that will entice participating stations to agree to sell their allotment. There definitely is a demand for this Spectrum block, though if the first round is in any indication, this is going to be a longer and more painful process than first imagined. Nokia Bell Labs will be presenting the results of an impressive joint experiment at the European Conference on Optical Communication in Dusseldorf, Germany on September 19th. They will show that an optical fiber network can net a one terabyte transmission rate. The new demonstration shows that performance of optical networks can be maximized when transmission rates dynamically adapt to the channel conditions and traffic demands. The terabyte rate is close to the theoretical maximum transfer rate of the channel and thus approaching the Shannon limit of the fiber link. The trial of the novel, novel modulation approach, known as probabilistic constellation shaping, or PCS, uses a quadrature amplitude 
modulation formats to achieve higher transmission capacity over a given channel to significantly improve the spectral efficiency of the optical communication. PCS is no, now part of this evolution by enabling and it increases an an optical fiber flexibility and performance that can move data traffic faster and over greater distances without the increased complexity of the optical network. Check out the ECOC on September 19th for more details. Hey, the next time a website asks you for personal info, remember this hack. Ars Technica published a story about how ClickSense blew it and stored passwords in plain text. For that, they were re rewarded by being hacked and losing 6.6 .6 million passwords and associated information. Right now, the hackers are generously offering the information from upwards of 4.4 million ClickSense survey accounts to other hackers on the open market. With very current information, this hack is even more valuable to the hacking community than the 2012 Dropbox breach. So the big question is... When are developers going to wise up and learn their lesson? Obviously, not soon enough. Now, there is no doubt that Google has the infrastructure muscle and network know-how to become a major cloud player. But even so, their offerings continue to lag behind both Amazon, AWS, and Microsoft Azure slash 365 in the enterprise space. Knowing that they're playing catch-up, Google is rolling out a big gun to attract customers machine learning. While AWS and Azure may hold an edge in customer base and deployments, Google is far ahead of Amazon and able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Microsoft in supporting applications that benefit from context-aware computing. For example, Disney utilized Google's Cloud Vision API to allow smartphones to recognize everyday items such as couches, cars, bikes, trees, and the like, giving users an augmented world filled with the characters from Pete's Dragon. Evernote moved from their private infrastructure to Google's cloud to take advantage of the Natural Language API to build intelligent applications that can trigger actions based on customer data in the popular note-taking service. While only time will tell if machine learning will give Google a critical mass of clients, it at least ensures that we continue a multi-competitor race for cloud computing. Is 300 miles not enough for your electrical vehicle, or do you want to worry less about whether you need to carry a charge before you get to the destination? Well, engineers at the North Carolina State University might have a solution for you. They have developed a new kind of inverter that can improve both the fuel efficiency and the range of both hybrid and electrical vehicles. The inverter helps electric or hybrid cars ensure enough energy gets from the battery to the motor when it's running. Normally, they're made from silicone. The team at the Future Renewable Energy Electrical Energy Distribution and Management Systems Center decided that they would build one out of silicone carbide instead, which can transfer 99% of the energy to the motor, resulting in a 2% boost over the silicon-based inverter counterpart. The new inverter can transmit 12.1 kilowatts of power per liter compared to the 20 to 2010 silicon inverter that could only handle 4.1 kilowatts per liter. Look forward to this work because ludicrous mode won't suck your battery dry anymore. <laughs> Just in case you've decided that all of the data caps and unlimited plans are too easy, Verizon's got a twist for you. In yet another twist on the data cap war, Verizon just removed the data caps on their NFL streaming app as part of the freebie program. Two of the first online services to pay Verizon for data cap exemption were Verizon's own Go90 streaming video service and the Verizon-owned AOL. Now, Verizon is also zero rating the NFL mobile from Verizon application. Bottom line on all this is that until the FCC decides on just how they're going to try to regulate things, the consumers, well, at least the consumers who like to watch NFL football, are winning. Uh, with an ubiquitous network now firmly entrenched in every area of our lives, including our bedrooms, more and more IT admins are starting to consider if it's time to turn off access point LEDs. At a gathering of university IT administrators, there was a surprisingly passionate conversation about the pros and cons of disab disabling LEDs on enterprise APs, especially on APs in residence halls, what us old folk used to call dorms. Some admins refused to out in the lights, saying that the technicians have an easier time of diagnosing problems with readily visible activity and link lights, while others have disabled them in moss, leading to better quality of life for on-campus students. Though my favorite takeaway, campuses who see a sharp uptick in trouble tickets from users who think the internet is down because they see an active AP with no lights, 
Well, those tickets are magically resolved when an IT admin switches the lights back on for just a few hours. Supercomputers are known for their energy consumption and COGS to run. A, Jap a Japan and Texas collaboration project and a new advanced computing system called Hikari, Japanese for the word light, came online at TAC this past month, running on solar power and high voltage direct current, or HVDC. Hikari is essentially a microgrid that supports a supercomputer. By day, the solar panel provides nearly all of Hikari's power up to 2008, I'm sorry, 208 kilowatts, but at night, it switches back to the conventional AC power from the utility grid. The project is more aimed at making data centers more efficient at using energy. They are, they are building new ways to interface other renewable-based technologies as well, including wind and hydrogen fuel cells. Hikari project also aims to demonstrate energy efficiency through more than just HV's DC. The HP, P, HPE Apollo 8000 system uses a warm water-based liquid cooling system that eliminates the need for fans within the nodes and reduces the energy that would normally be required for water refrigeration and excess heat removal. The entire project will hopefully prove out and be adapted to some of the largest enterprise data center implementations in the near future. Well, if you've got enterprise employees who are still using a Lumia phone, it's time to make plans to move. We saw that Microsoft laid off most of the old Nokia phone folks, and they've now announced that the Lumia line is going away. Now, we don't have any inside knowledge yet here at Twyet, but I think it's reasonable to expect something concrete about what's going, and more important, what's coming at Microsoft's October event that will most likely announce a Surface phone. File this one under something just a little bit different. Mr. Robot, the smart security thriller on the USA network that mixes hacktivism, clinical depression, and moments of WTF, has become a breakout hit known for its gritty take on technology and social justice. The acting and narrative style has pulled in the tech-challenged and IT professionals alike, something that is rare in cyber thrillers. And now, we know why. Yesterday, Lost, the mind behind DEF CON's crypto challenge, started receiving phone calls from Mr. Robot fans. In fact, more than 8,000 calls as of 11 p.m. last night. It seems that a miscommunication led a consultant for Mr. Robot to include the crypto challenge that Lost created for DEF CON 22 in both the show and the Mr. Robot ARG. Lost embedded a phone number in that challenge, and now crypto puzzle hungry fans have been clawing their way through his challenge and calling the number, which is linked, in true Mr. Robot form, to a burner cell phone that Lost owns. Now, this could have gone down poorly, but thankfully, security professionals are smart and production people are savvy. Mr. Robot is now in talks to bring Lost and his new company into Mr. Robot's fold. As his work is essentially the core of Season 2, Lost sees it as a way to get more people interested in crypto and spread the joy of intellectual puzzles. Also, he's randomly answering the burner phone to bring just a little DEF CON weirdness where it's needed. If you think you have what it takes, get over to Mr. Robot, find the number, and maybe you can talk to the guy behind the robot. Well, that does it for the blips. Next up, we've got an interview with, uh, well, none other than the Mr. Rob Fuller, if you spent any time over at Hack5, or if you've browsed the web looking for security researchers who are just really good personalities, you probably know him as Mubix. We had a chance to sit down with him and talk about the latest vector of exploit that he found, unfortunately something that's built into both PCs and Macs. If you've been anywhere near the internet, you know that there's a lot of talk about a new exploit that uses a USB computer to capture credentials. Well, we could talk about the rumors. We could maybe even theorize how it works, but I thought it might be better to actually bring the security researcher who found it out. And that's why we're speaking with Rob Fuller. He's known as Mubix on the internet. He is a security researcher extraordinaire. You may have seen him over at <laughs> Hack5. He's come into the Twit Studios to explain and demo how this exploit works. Rob, thank you very much for talking to us. No problem. Now, we heard about this first, uh, well, a long time ago. This is not a new exploit. This is the capturing yeah. of credentials. But what has captured people's imagination, and I'd say their fears, is the fact that this is now done on a piece of hardware. Can right. you explain how this works? Yeah, so um, the the USB armory um, is a small uh, board on, or computer on stick uh, PC that has uh, the ability when you plug it in to be a USB Ethernet device. Same with the Hack5 uh, 
turtle. So when you plug it in, it boots up and does the same thing as if you connected it, connected it with a USB Ethernet cable. So it pretends that it's you know a standard device on the on the same network. Then the computer says, "Hey, oh, I'm now connected to a new Ethernet device. I'm going to connect." Um, so like like you said originally, this is nothing new. This is as if you just plugged in a Ethernet cable to um, your computer running Kali Linux or something like that uh, to a, a victim PC. So all I did was shorten the cable basically <laughs> and put it on a single device. Um, so when you plug it in, it it does all that and then starts up a tool called Responder. Now, a lot of computers automatically make all kinds of network traffic. Uh, Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, they all make this network traffic. Um, and what's nice about this attack is that normally er, most PCs trust their local network, just implicitly. Um, especially with Windows, it will automatically authenticate to anything on its local network that is looking for a share or stuff like that. So instead of attacking the host directly, I'm just waiting with this with this uh, hardware tool for someone to come and look for things. Okay, so let's let's unpack that because that was actually pretty deep. It was okay. pretty, pretty well woven. First of all, there's this. So this is the hardware. If you go to the uh, the overhead cam here, now a, a USB device. It's it's an interesting. It's a curious thing mm -hmm. in modern computing because the computer trusts the USB device. Whatever the USB device tells the computer it is, the computer just says, you must be that. Right. Which is what like the Hack 5 Turtle takes advantage of. Right. I can reprogram my firmware to say, I'm a keyboard, I'm a mouse, or in this particular case, it says, I am a network adapter. Yep. Now, what does it take advantage of? So when I plug, say, a, uh, a new USB to Ethernet dongle into mm -hmm. my laptop, and, and that computer, and that, la that dongle then connects to my network, yep. what is happening? What is, what is this able to capture by pretending to be an Ethernet device? Sure, so because of how Windows does networking, um, normally wireless is automatically a lower metric. It determines routes and paths by via net, uh, metrics. Um, Mac does about the same thing with, with some little tweaks to it. But um, because it's plugging in and because the Hack 5 Turtle and, and the USB Armory both seem like they're 10, 100 or 10, you know, a gigabit network connections, it's always gonna beat it out. So it becomes the default gateway. It becomes the default DNS servers. And because of that, it then sends all of its traffic towards that device. Right, right. And every time a device connects to a network, naturally, it's going to send out, especially if you've got yours set to automatically detect local proxies right. and, and authentication service. It's going to send its credentials over that device, which it assumes is just a regular Ethernet adapter. Right. And then you have the advantage, you have the ability to capture that. Right. So again, with the responder tool, because it says it's local uh, local network mm -hmm. and that implicit trust comes through um, it automatically tries to authenticate to the responder tool and the responder tool starts up all of these different services automatically um, like SMB server, HTTP server, proxy server and all these things that normal network connected computers are always looking for. Right. Oh, Rob, there there are some people out there who are uber paranoid and they think, oh, this is this is one of those supercomputers that we saw in in Iron Man 2 where you plug it in and, and it just it breaks the password and now I have the password and I can get into the computer. That's not actually what this does, right? I mean, not, yeah, no. exactly. So explain the difference between capturing someone's authentication information and capturing their login credentials. Sure. So this is not plain text uh, passwords at all, um, what is happening is it's capturing network-based authentication. Mm -hmm. Now, by default, Windows uses um, NTLM v1 or v2. Um, and if you're Vista and above, it's always v2, and you can, you can change that in configuration. But the reason why v1 and v2 came into play was Microsoft, way back in you know the day, said, hey, we don't want to send even a hashed password over the network. Right. So what they do is they send a um, a challenger in response. So one computer will say, hey, I want to open a share on X. Um, and then the computer two says, okay, I'm X. You want to open the share. Here's this server challenge. And this is a random string. I think it's 16 bytes long and I could be wrong on that. But it then says, okay, computer one then takes its password that it knows and salts it with that new challenge, then sends it over the wire and then, you know, X compares that to what it already knows with the challenge it knows. So it does that for NTLM v1, v2, a lot more complex because it has a client mm -hmm. challenge as well. So 
and it also has a bunch of different crypto options in there that have changed too. So, um, so that's all you're capturing. That you're you're capturing this salted slash um, network communication. And while it is um, their credential in a sense, it's salted and has all these things that add to the complexity for when you're trying to crack it into a um, clear text credential. And it's important to note that I could do this before. Any Absolutely. any man in the middle attack that gives me access to the traffic, I would be able to capture this, but because it's hardware and because it works so quickly, it's it's a new vector. It's something right. that I can physically plug into a machine and within 20 seconds be able to walk away. I now have that on the device and I can, I can crack it at my leisure. Yeah, so a couple of use case scenarios that I've heard so far is, um, you know, going up to the cleaning lady or cleaning guy and said, hey, would you, while you're walking around, can you just plug these into a couple things? The light's going to turn off. And, and then afterwards, give it to me and I'll give you $1,000. Um, so that's the evil vector that mm -hmm. is obvious. And then uh, one of the positive vectors that I've seen is, um, so for forensic guys who have had to try and crack like hard drive encryption and stuff like that for criminals, they now see this as a vector where they can plug it in um, while the computer's live and get the credential and then be able to log into the um, hard drive encrypted device. Right, right. Uh, once they have that uh, that salted hash, so mm -hmm. they've got the authentication information, but they, they do need to crack it. Um, I know that it, it varies greatly on how much power and how much time you need to be able to to crack that hash. What what would you typically see? So uh, let, let's just take Joe Schmo computer who doesn't know much about networking. Mm -hmm. He has a MacBook that he brings in to work every day and he plugs it in. Uh, he has a eight character password. I know you can't give an exact time because right. it's going to differ greatly depending on how complex he made his password sure. or whether he not he uses he used spaces. But would I be able to crack that hash in a reasonable amount of time to make this attack useful? So two answers. Um, first, because the Macs use NTLM v1 by default instead of v2, um, there is a public uh, documentation and things t on how to crack that down, mm -hmm. down to NTLM. So no matter how long that person's password is, it can be 400 characters long. Um, that can still be cracked down within about 23 hours down to an NTLM v version of the hash. And then they can use it to uh, across the network. Now, if they had, if you had a Windows box using NTLM v2 or an up, up to date or configured Mac, um, then a eight character password can be cracked within about a couple seconds. Like wow. it's really fast on a, on a, on an up to date graphics card. You start adding characters um, and that's where password strength gets into play. If you start adding characters, you start adding uh, exponents of time. Okay. Now let's actually show people what this looks like because they, they might be wondering if this is too complicated for them to imagine. Uh, could you run the attack on your laptop right now? No. Please? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so again, this is a very simple attack. It's, uh, it just has a GCP server and responder on it. That's right. all that's really configured on this thing. So it's not like someone couldn't just go out and set this up. Right. Um, I detail it on my blog. So all I'm doing is plugging this in, hopefully. You know. So this Mac is completely locked out. Uh, if you switch to HDMI, you'll see just a black screen and it's going on. Yep, black screen. So okay. here you start seeing the machine, the uh, USB armory booted up. It starts clicking off uh, CPU so cycles. So right now it's pretending to be the Ethernet adapter, and it's yep. saying, "Okay, I need credentials for yep. this network resource." And hopefully, it will turn off in a second. So here. it's been about seven seconds so far. Yeah, the Macs usually take a little bit longer. Whoa. So there it is. So I logged in and I've gone into my responder logs, and as you can see. Um, both here and here, I've got some proxy authentication, and that's what really um, works over the uh, Mac. And then the SMB um, on on uh, Windows is what I had earlier. So if I cat the the proxy authentication, this is NTLM v2. Um, uh, v1 is what you get from HTTP stuff, and that didn't happen as fast as I'd like. We cat that out, and you can see that user, my domain, there's the challenge, there's the client challenge, and there's the rest of the hash. Wow. So Yep. And it happened uh, quite a few times by the time I unplugged and plugged it in. And so, again, you, you could give this to the cleaning woman and she could just plug it into every computer on a floor and it would all show up here. I'd have 
the different users, the, any different domains that they might be connected to, and yep. all the hashes, and I can crack them whenever I feel like it. Right, and you could you could keep this around just as you're going around to different places, and just keep putting plugging it in, and then you know finally take it back somewhere and then crack it. But yeah, you know, one of the the components of this is people might be freaked out. Um, they really shouldn't be because this has been possible for a very very long time. And the other thing is that this isn't technically a bug. Right. This was a feature. This was something that people wanted because they wanted to be able to quickly connect to network resources. Right. So I, I got to ask you, what are the mitigation strategies? Can, can I turn off those those features? Can I turn off those network resources? Yeah, um, so it's a, one of the hardest problems I've, I've had to deal with because um, I've been working with a lot of a lot of people who've responded to, the, to some of the press and trying to figure out what the best way to do things. Um, there's a a blog post that came out exactly the same day um, as I I published mine uh, called uh, from exploitmonday.com, and they had a great article on on writing up uh, Matt Graber uh, had a great article on writing up uh, Device Guard, which is a new thing for Windows 10, I think. It might be 8.1 or 8, um, that allowed you to restrict different devices based on different features. So you can say in your enterprise, no more USB Ethernet. But as as we talked offline, right. um, a lot of computers these days aren't having Ethernet cables or, or uh, RJ45s in them anymore, right? So it's hard to do. So how do you mitigate this from a uh, technology point, uh, an OS standpoint? Well, you can make it only Kerberos. So Kerberos is harder to crack, but Responder also does Kerberos. So two is one, one is none, right? So um, half a dozen, whatever. Um, so it's really hard to kind of mitigate this. And I've I've been working on it, and I'm I don't have a solution yet. <laughs> yeah, and, and and again, that's because since it's not based on an exploit, you can't fix the exploit. It's based right. on a feature, and right. you can't fix the feature without breaking the way that a lot of us authenticate with our networks. Right. Oh wow. Okay. So I, I guess we're gonna have to leave you in despair, folks. That's I'm sorry. that's just the way it works. If you have an op if you have an option, if you have a way to fix this thing, please let me know. I'd love to burn love out to burn out the USB ports. I think that that would probably yeah. well, actually no, that wouldn't work because they'd, they'd still be able to do this attack, just not with the hardware. Right. Yep. Go figure. Rob Fuller, thank you very much for joining us. Now, sure. if they want to find out more about your work, they mo maybe find out more about what you do with Hack Five, more sure. about the seminars that you teach. Where should they go? Um, so room362.com is where I have all of my stuff posted. I also host Metasploit Minute on the Hack Five channel, um, but at Mubix. Uh, I don't know. Like that's that's where you can find me. Absolutely a pleasure. Always an honor. I, I've I've seen you at uh, DefCon in passing, and yep. uh, I see you on on the Hack Five network. So thank you for sharing your network knowledge. Sure, no problem. Thanks. Now this uh, th this is probably one of the least scary and yet most important vulnerabilities that I've seen in a while. Uh, you know, Lou Curtis, this is something that we could do for a long time. Anytime we talked about a man in the middle attack, these were the credentials that we could hijack. This is the stuff that we could take offline and hash, uh, crack hash at, uh, at our own leisure. But to have an actual piece of hardware, a single stick that someone who is not computer savvy at all could go around and plug them into random computers, Mac and PC, and then bring them back to someone who actually does have network knowledge, I think that's that's what's captured people's imagination. You know, not that this is a new thing, but this is a new vector and it lends itself to being very abused. Uh, Lou, what are your thoughts? I mean, what do you have, I'm not going to say what company you might be working with, but what do you have at that place, at campus near Redmond, Washington, that uh, could stop someone from going desktop to desktop, laptop to laptop, and just co collecting credentials? You know, there's different tiers, there's different layers of security, obviously. I mean, there's obviously building security. You know, you only have access to the areas you're supposed to have access to. Um, you know, and guests have to sign in and they have to go through this whole process and so on and so forth. Some areas you can't even have guests. Um, and also they have, you know, constant security people walking around. People's offices are normally locked. Uh, USB ports are normally blocked. So, I mean, there's there's lots of things that can have, you know, you know, get through. I mean, people need to get through in order to get to those scenarios. Um, but, you know, if let's say somebody decided to get into the building, they got through the restricted area, they somehow got into your office, then there really is nothing stopping them from finding a computer or PC and plugging a device into it. So, I mean, and let, you know, th if these other layers fail, you're kind of out of luck at that point. Right, right. And, and in fact, 
Uh, someone, some people have been suggesting, well, you know, keep your your laptop locked. Uh, always have a strong password on it. The problem with that is both Mac and PC, even if it's still locked, if you turn them on and you plug in a USB to Ethernet adapter, it will attempt to make its network authentication. That's what it does. It's supposed to do that. So unless you disable that feature on both OSs and say, look, unless the the computer is unlocked, do not attempt to attach any USB devices. That's still a vulnerability. Curtis, this this idea of physical control of the workstation is something that has come and gone over the years. Do you see that there's there's very little, well, uh, transparency as far as company policies on keeping a tight hold on the physical access to their, their workstations and laptops? You know, the, the best that I've seen is actually uh, pretty simple, and it, it is something that argues in favor of the laptop as a workstation, and that is the companies that I know that require employees to turn their laptops off and lock them in a desk drawer or a, uh, a storage uh, compartment at the end of every day. Uh, as you say, the physical access is the key here this is not some this is not an exploit uh that happens uh over wireless or remotely or listening to the keystrokes or anything like that they have to have physical access to a usb port so uh on the one hand it's pretty simple lock the machine up and it takes away an attack vector on the other hand that does require this additional layer of physical security that a lot of people love to pretend just doesn't exist for uh, the IT world. Right. And, you know, one of the things to remember is I can do this attack without that USB armory. If I'm a man in the middle, if I'm snooping on your network, if I run an ARP cache po uh, a poisoning attack, I can intercept all your traffic and just get the same information that we got off of the USB armory. And again, it's just that this, this new attack vector has people scared because of the aforementioned cleaning lady scenario where you have someone who is, you just pay a couple of bucks every time you go to a cubicle, plug this into the computer, wait until that light is solid and then give, give it back to me. So go figure. We're going to talk more about that. I'm, I'm actually going to ask Rob Fuller to come back onto the show during a roundtable on privacy and uh, talk about some mitigation strategies for, well, per physical attacks in general. Let's talk a little bit about personal sec. But before we do that, Let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you remember a time when you actually had to be in the office to be considered working? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, that bosses felt that unless their employees were physically in the office, in their cubicle, at their desk, that they couldn't demand productivity out of them. Well, thankfully, the more enlightened companies have seen the error of that ways. You can get plenty of productivity. In fact, you can get some inspired productivity from your employees if you let them work where they are most productive. Well, in order to do that, you have to make sure that they have the tools, that they have the information, that they have access to all the resources on the network that they should have access to, and you need to do it in a way that lets them access it on the devices that they actually use. That's why we're so happy to have Igloo as a sponsor of the Twilight Riot. Now, Igloo is a modern intranet designed to keep everybody on the same page. You can share files, have real conversations in real time, and do it all while still being able to use the apps that you currently use, like Box, Google Drive, and Skype. Igloo brings everything together. It creates a single destination that lets you focus on your work rather than on the tools. And really, that's the important piece. That's, that's the, the crux of what Igloo can offer to you. It's a cloud platform that enables you to share files, to collaborate on documents, to blog updates, to coordinate calendars and manage projects all from the same attractive and intuitive interface. It comes with SSL and 256-bit encryption baked in that protects your igloo, meaning that your administrator can set policies to authenticate and identify to ensure that only authorized users can use drag-and-drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor to do the work that they need to do. And unlike a lot of other solutions out there, Igloo lets you customize your platform and integrate your existing IT investments. This means that there's no forklift upgrade. You don't have to dump everything that you've bought before. You can use Office 365, Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, and file sharing solutions like Google Drive and Dropbox, and even ticketing solutions like Zendesk, all within your Igloo with your branding. And that's the most important part. With your branding, your look and feel, your users will be able to see and access all the resources that you've made available in one attractive interface that is accessible on the desktop, on mobile, pretty much everywhere that they might want to work. The TLDR version is Igloo 
is an internet that you'll actually like. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. When you sign up through our link, you can get your own igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. Just go to igloosoftware.com slash twit. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. And we thank Igloo for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Now is my uh, favorite time of the show where we get to introduce a guest who is willing to share his knowledge about the field that we love so much. So we welcome Guido Appenzeller. I, did I say that correctly, sir? That was perfect. All right. He is the chief strategy of, uh, technology strategy officer over at VMware. Sir, of course, everyone in our audience has heard about your company. We know what you are. We know what you've done. We know that you've taken the art of virtualization and uh, turned it into something, well, that, that is commonplace. Something that 10 years ago we, we didn't really even understand is now just accepted to be a part of the IT landscape. Could you tell me just really quickly, how have you seen virtualization change over the last, say, 15 years? Wow, I mean, I think 15 years ago, virtualization was still in its infancy, right? It was this, this very early stake technology that uh, was used in, in QA and, and development. And, um, you know, it, it's come a huge way. I mean, today, a typical customer I talk to, like if I talk to a large bank, like in, on Wall Street, I would say probably they have between 70 and 80% of all of their workloads are running on virtualized infrastructure, right? So we, we've made huge advances there. It's become a, a very basic building block um, of a modern data center architecture. Right, now... Of course, VMware right now is in a pivot point. It's, it's looking to the future. It's looking to see where it can get value for its shareholders, where its customers want it to go. And one of the key pieces of that, uh, I'm going to call it a pivot, of that pivot has been VMware NSX. We've heard a lot of buzz about this. We've, we've seen it in the blips many, many times. If you were to give me an elevator pitch to tell me why I needed v uh, NSX, what would it be? So... Yeah, if, I think you said it well, right? If if you look at what VMware has traditionally done, we've we've virtualized servers, and um, you know th there was a bread and butter business for a long time, but but today VMware is actually a lot more. And uh, you know one of the the things that I'm very excited about is NSX, which I think in its simplest form you can say we're doing with networks exactly the same thing that we're doing with servers before, right? So if you take a hypervisor like ESX, or you may know Fusion from your from your uh, for your Mac, right? Um, it basically takes a server and it divides it up into multiple virtual servers, and each server is is isolated from the others. You know, if, if you have a, uh, for example, a program that that crashes or that gets hacked on one of these virtual servers, they essentially can't do much to affect the the other servers that are running on the same physical hardware, right? So it provides very strong isolation. What we're doing with NSX is, is fundamentally exactly the same idea for the network, right? So just like with servers, you still need a physical server underneath. So you need a physical network underneath, right? That doesn't go away. And, and we don't sell that. We work with partners, you know, like uh, uh, Arista, Cisco, you know, many others. Pretty much any networking hardware will do. But then we have a software layer on top that allows you to take this physical network and divide it up into multiple virtual networks, Right, and and that's that's a it's a huge step forward because you can in these virtual networks you can suddenly do things like for example you want to create a new virtual switch or virtual router well it's just an API call or something you can configure in a user interface right we can just create these things on the fly you want a virtual firewall you can just create these things on the fly you want a virtual load balance you can just create these on the fly all you can automate them you know it's it becomes a, a completely different paradigm of how you manage networks right I, I remember when we uh, first had VMware come into the interop net. Uh, it was it was that moment. Probably it took about two weeks before we fully understood what we had in our hands. It was oh wait a minute, I don't have to care about the physical boxes anymore. I don't have to care about yeah. care about the two forty two U racks of pizza boxes that I had stacked up for all of my services. I just spin things up and down as I need them, and then I get rid of them when they're no longer useful. But and I see the analogy you're trying to make that you're trying to do the same thing right now for cloud service computing as you did for servers. 15 years ago. But some astute listeners would say, but these are different, right? I mean, I, I understand the consolidation of pizza boxes into one big pile of processing and memory, but how do you compile 
all these different cloud services that are all trying to differentiate themselves based on what they offer and how they offer it. You know, everything from Google doing machine learning to uh, to uh, Microsoft in big data analytics to AWS with just the incredible range of tools that they have available. Yeah. How do you take all of those which are so different, even though they're under the, the heading of cloud services, and make them a single VMware box appliance service? Yeah, yeah. So let's let me break this down a little bit. There's a there's a lot of uh, different things there. So the the first thing that we did is, you know, we started out virtualizing servers on premises in your in your classic data center, right? With with the server virtualization, and then we introduced NSX, where we're essentially doing the same thing for networks, and then you know things like vSAN, we're doing the same thing for for storage, and then on top of that, we have a management layer that basically allows you to manage across all these things. But up to that point, it's still everything that's running on your on premises a physical. Uh, hardware. Does that make sense? So there's so the the cloud. So far, we haven't talked about it at all. This is just still on premise. Right. Now the next step, and that's the thing we we just showed. Uh, you know that, that I currently I'm uh, I'm super excited about is um, how we're starting to extend that into the public cloud. Right. So we're seeing our customers are starting to move workloads. You know from on premises to Amazon and Azure and Google. Right. It's still uh, uh, in terms of overall percentage a small amount, but th there's a huge amount of opportunity there, and we want them to support them as they're doing that right and so we, we basically kicked off an internal project where we just you know challenged our engineers and said look why can't we do the same thing that we're doing on premises in the in, you know on, on top of an amazon right the initial reaction was like look it's it's different we don't control the hypervisor but we have we have a fantastic engineering team and you know two weeks later they basically came back with a prototype and said well it turns out we can do pretty much all the same things right so what we showed at vmworld is how we can for example take a, a network a virtual network right with virtual switches and virtual routers and and stretch it from an on-premises deployment to a cloud deployment right so i can take workloads on amazon and, and on-premise and put them on the same network, right? And then go one step further, maybe encrypt that network, right? Which again, gives me a huge amount of flexibility. Now, we're not gonna do this for every possible service, right? So for, for networking, for storage, for, for compute, for management, for operations, for security, I think those are all things that are that are close to, to our business. You know, I think when it comes to managing, I don't know, Google Translate or so, that's probably a little bit at least further away. I'm not sure if we're ever gonna do that. Just That's just not the, uh, you know, the. I think we're fundamentally still uh, a company that's centered around infrastructure. So if something looks like infrastructure, we, we're interested in doing this. If it's some, some very high level service, you know, like, Amazon has these mobile gaming platforms, right? That's not a thing we're targeting. Got it, got it. Okay. Uh, I, I got to bring in some questions here from our chat room. We've got a, a fantastic group of very smart people who are all in the, in the industry. Specifically, we've got JJ to the 4884 and Emily the Strange, two longtime listeners of This Week in Enterprise Tech, asking about the competitive advantage, specifically the competitive mm -hmm. advantage compared to some open source solutions that seem to be providing yeah. the same thing. And they're looking at things like OpenStack. They're looking at things like Docker. Different types of technology, but if an IT exec were to come to you and say, why should I choose NSX over doing everything in containers? Or why should I choose NSX yeah. versus doing some sort of custom configuration with OpenStack, what would your answer be? You shouldn't. <laughs> okay, okay, so good, honest. The two are actually really complementary. So, so let me let me try to break this down, right? Um, OpenStack started as an open source project, right? Um, today, actually, pretty much in the enterprise space, the, the, the you know the hyperscale operator is a little bit different, but in the enterprise space, everybody that I know consumes OpenStack as a distribution. You know, you go to Red Hat, you go to Mirantis. In fact, you can go to VMware. We have uh, something called VMware Integrated OpenStack. Great product, right? You can get an OpenStack distribution from us. But independently which one you use, right? If you use Red Hat or Mirantis or, or VMware for your OpenStack deployment, you can put NSX underneath. NSX works with KVM hypervisors just as well as it works with vSphere. Okay, I like that. Actually, that was a far more honest answer than I'm sure some people in our chat room were expecting. They they always expect that they're going to get the next marketing pitch, the next, well, be offered best of breed this and best practices that. But that's good. You you see this I'm, as a I'm compliment. I'm a big fan of open source. I mean, I, I, you know, frankly. And uh, to, to your second, the second part of the question, how about Docker, right? Um, right. It's the same thing, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of containers. If, if I would build... A, a, a new application from scratch today, I would build it in containerized infrastructure, right? You know, Docker files are fantastic. I like the Docker host. Uh, you know, if you prefer Kubernetes, that works as well, right? I mean, these are um, the, the, the layered, um, the, the layered 
formats for defining your applications, I think, are far superior than the, the classic opaque VM images that, we, that we've used in the past, right? Um, that still works with NSX or with other VMware infrastructure, though. For example, um, we, we demoed at DockerCon in, uh, in Seattle. When was it? About two months ago or so, right? Um, we, we showed how we can use NSX together with Docker. So basically, you can, uh, you know, you, you go into Docker, you say Docker Network Create, and that creates a virtual switch on the NSX side where the individual containers show up as endpoint on that switch. So basically, all this power of managing your network, of, you know, creating security groups, of managing compliance, of plumbing this into the other applications in your data center, you can now use the same power and unleash that on your container environment. All right, good. I want to go back to that because two years ago, I was at VMworld here in San Francisco, and I did see that demonstration. It, it, it was actually kind of fun. It was sort of a cool down pavilion, and they had Prince of Persia, like the original game, running inside of a container inside yeah. of VMware's hypervisor. It was very mm -hmm. interesting yeah. sort of proof of concept. I didn't get to go to the show this year, but tell me how that works. So if I want to run a mixed environment and I want, I, I'm, I'm set on using NSX, how would I do that? How, how do I run my VMs, my fat VMs, right alongside my really skinny containers? Right. So let me lay it out for you. There's two options depending on how much VMware you want to consume, right? Let me start with the, with the more VMware one, which is obviously my favorite, right? We have something called VMware Integrated Containers. And the idea is that you as a developer, you, you still use the Docker command line arguments. You still use the Docker APIs, right? So you, 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 no, no change for you as a developer. But... The underlying infrastructure that these containers run on is actually VMware. So these each container gets mapped to a virtual machine inside of vSphere, right? That means you have a little bit more overhead, but you also have a lot more security in terms of how this container is isolated from other containers, right? You're not relying on the kernel alone to do the separation, but you actually have the hypervisor providing much stronger separation. So that's your option one, right? One container on each virtual machine, and then NSX plugs underneath just the same way it plugs into our virtual machine infrastructure. That was one, right? Option number two, if you want to go more the open source route, you can just take standard Docker, maybe run it in KVM, um, and then we actually have a hypervisor switch that plugs into KVM underneath, right? where NSX can basically program the, the, the KVM hypervisor switch, and we can still provide you with a full networking solution for the containers in an open source environment. Wow, okay. So you pick. I like that. Options are good. And... It does seem to, to solve, at least maybe on the surface, one of the big issues that so many of us have had with containers, which, which are they, they're, they're great. They're very useful. I love that they're lightweight. I love that I can spin up just the things I need at that particular time. But their security has not been great. And security has been the biggest criticism of yeah. containers. And that's why people say, well, they're, they're nice, but they're not quite ready for enterprise-wide deployment. Do you see VMware as providing that last piece for containers? I mean, if you can do this, if you can take as many containers as you want and have them contained within, say, that, uh, uh, that one segmentation off the KVM, does that make it a more secure system where you can actually partition off these services from one another? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let, let, me, let me paint a little bit of broader picture here. Right? The, if I talk to large enterprise customers, let's say a bank or a big healthcare organization, right? I don't think I've ever seen anybody run containers directly on bare metal, right? So basically just installing container hosts directly on the operating system without any hypervisor in between, right? And the reason is, as you pointed out, security, right? Because if somebody can, can break into a container and they find a kernel vulnerability that allows privilege escalation, they can now take over the entire container host. They can break into it easily, I mean, they, they, they control the containers of other applications, they can potentially use that to hop around, they can take over the system, they can sniff the network, you know, they can write themselves into a firmware, they have lots of options uh, of what they can do, right? So, so uh, enterprises today, I would say almost 100% are running the containers inside of virtual machines. Right? The hyperscale is different, right? Google or somebody like that, they have very homogeneous infrastructure, they can handle differently, but the enterprise is almost 100%. Um, the, the hypervisor can be VMware or it can be KVM, right? So there's multiple solutions. But my, my prediction is that I think in the future, all containers will run inside of virtual machines just as an additional security layer. Right? Now, that doesn't mean they're managed via the virtual machine management system, right? Uh, you know, people, like specifically developers, they love the tools from Docker and Kubernetes to spin up and shut down containers. And I think they will use those. And I think the, the challenge for us as VMware is to provide the, the, the developers with sort of a native 
container interface that allows them to to use these containers but at the same time behind it putting this this very very high security very reliable infrastructure um, you know that the IT teams are used to uh, that, that allows them to provision their mission critical workloads because you know long term you don't want to just put your web lock into a container you want to put your your trading system in there or you know your, your banking system and for, for those they have you know there's all kinds of compliance regulations it's very very complex and that's really the problem we're trying to solve here uh, Guido, I, I know you're running out of time, and so I want to respect your uh, your schedule. So let me bring back my co-host, because you said something that I think they, they'd love to comment on. Curtis Liu, Guido said that he sees in the future 100% of containers running inside of VMs. In the enterprise. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, in the enterprise, I mean, if you are concerned about security, if you are looking for a way to, to take the flexibility of a container and yet have the manageability of a VM... This is is this a useful strategy, Curtis? Let's start with you. Do, do you see where this could be a good pitch to that CTO or that CIA, CIO, explaining why you need NSX in addition to containers? Oh, I do think it makes sense, and I do think it can be successfully pitched to those CTOs and, and CIOs. I think that before there is universal acceptance of, of the strategy, we are going to see some companies that. Uh, provide counterexamples to their uh, their peers by trying to to cheap out and by cheap I'm not saying that they they want to save licensing costs I, they're not um, trivial but but they aren't a deciding factor no the the cheaping out is in terms of the expertise and time commitment required from staff to implement the the dual layer approach do I think it makes absolute sense yes do I think it can be sold to the executive suite? Yes. Do I think that there are going to be some IT managers who try to get away without doing that? Oh, yeah. you betcha. <laughs> of course. Uh, Lou, let me ask you, because you're more on the development side. Do you see a future for this? Because at some point, I mean, and let's, let's be honest, your premier product, CRM, Dynamics, is going to end up in some sort of container because people like the idea of being able to spin it up when you need it, spin it down when you don't. Do you see multiple instances of CRM running inside of a VM uh, that is spread out over both premise and various cloud services? Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting concept because you think you, you can, like you said, you have isolation and you have this ability to kind of scale the system out. And one thing that I, you know, that we do notice, and this is probably something that will be improved over time, is there are some concerns around performance. You see some kind of overhead when you, if you're going to run containers within inside of a VM. So I'm, my guessing is over time they will overcome that those limitations. But from a development perspective, it's very interesting because you can actually uh, be kind of testing different variants of your of your of your code and of your build system of your binaries in these containers that are running inside of a VM <clears throat> and you have that kind of additional layer of isolation so i think that i think there's different kind of takes on it but i'm hoping that um, you know they can, they can come over some of those issues that they have and we'll be able to kind of use them in the near future uh, guido uh, let me ask you this we all see the future for this I, I think it's it's pretty clear that uh, Curtis Liu and myself understand where you're going. We understand the advantages of running containers inside of a VM. It, it does give you more manageability. It does give you more security. It it brings containers up to enterprise level technology. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest obstacle for VM right now? VMware right now. So you you are setting off on this grand plan that has NSX at its core. Uh, to to integrate both VMs and containers into one, and then to allow a enterprise to spread that out over premise, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, wherever it might want to be. Uh, I, I think at, at uh, VM World this year, the the thing was by 2020, a no cloud policy will be as rare as a no internet policy is today. So I, I mean, think that's about right. Yeah, that's about mm -hmm. right. So, yeah. But what's what's going to stop you? What's the biggest competitor? What's the biggest obstacle? What's the thing that people need to get educated about before they actually understand the advantage of this approach? Look, I mean, IT is currently going through only the second big structural transition in the whole of the history of IT, of how we do compute, right? We had the mainframe model, then we had the client server model, and now we're moving to the cloud model. This, this is a huge monumental shift. And, you know, frankly, this is very challenging for, for a company like us because it means we have to develop new products, right? We have to develop new services. Um, 
we internally have to new learn skills. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, we certainly have to develop our software as SaaS. We have to, to run on top of public clouds, right? It's a, it's a, it's a major initiative, but um, you know, I'm actually very excited about it because I think that the thing I realized over the last half year or so was that even in a world of cloud, there's a need for infrastructure software that, that does many of the things uh, that you have on-prem in the cloud, right? Just like on-premises today, what VMware does is provides this, this hypervisor layer, right, that allows you to, for example, move a workload from a Dell server to an HP server. And you don't have to think about, uh, you know, if this works or not, if you have driver problems, because we take care of that. And we can scan, we can stretch networks over heterogeneous switches, right? And we can uh, stretch storage across heterogeneous servers. And, and at the end of the day, I think all of these things still apply in the, in the public cloud, right? And we have to learn learn new tricks in order to make these things happen. But, um, you know, if uh, if we can pull that off, I think we have a, we have a great future ahead of us. So it's, it's a big journey for us, and I'm really excited. All right, Guido, I, I understand you have to go, but I, I'd like to get one more question in before I, I give you Please. your time to plug. And that is we have a lot of people in the chat room who are asking about the affordability of VMware. And, and specifically, some of them are saying, hey, could VMware go the Apple approach, where if you're a student or if you're a developer, you can get a less expensive option, anything to bring people into the VMware garden so that they can see these benefits? I mean, I think there is a perception, especially among those people who don't have huge enterprise budgets, that VMware is just a solution that they'll never be able to afford. To those people, what would you say? Look, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly biased here, but I, I think... Uh, if you fully leverage the solutions that we provide, it provides you with a fantastic amount of value, right? I mean, if you're, if you're a large enterprise, the amount of agility that you gain in terms of how you provision workloads, you know, the, the, how quickly you can provision networks is usually very much worth, uh, you know, the cost of the software. That being said, I think as we move specifically into a public cloud environment, we have to change how we price and how we sell, right? If, if you, uh, if you, build an application Amazon, you're used to being charged by the hour, right? You're used to being able to try out a service and, and see if it works and not having to call or talk to a salesperson, uh, you know, before you do that. And so so I think the way how we go to market that has to change. And uh, we're actually planning a couple of exciting things that you'll see uh, over the next uh, six to 12 months. We've been speaking with Guido Appenzeller. He's the Chief Technology Strategy Officer at VMware. Sir, thank you very much for coming on. I mean, this this was fantastic. Thanks for having me. You were honest. You were frank with our audience. In fact, I, I'd love to invite you back. I know that Chibert's working on a couple of panels. Would you be willing to come back and speak with the Twite Riot once again? And anytime. Would love to. Fantastic. And, and before you go, could you please tell them where they can find you, where they can find your work, where they can find VMware, where they can find out more information about NSX? Absolutely. So we at VMware.com uh, for NSX. Just Google NSX. It'll send you uh, in the right direction. And if you have anything for me, I'm at Appenz, so A-P-P-E-N-Z uh, on Twitter, the best way to reach me. Once again, Guido Appenzeller, we thank you for being on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Thank you. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 containers inside of a virtual machine. I want to thank my co-hosts for being here. I wouldn't want to do Twiat without them. Uh, Curtis, let's start with you. Information Week Radio is growing. It's got a lot of people interested. You always cover topics that are near and dear to the heart of every IT professional. What's coming up next and uh, where are you going to take us? Well, we actually have one of our new podcasts that went live today. I interviewed Martha Heller, who's a very well-known executive recruiter in the IT space. She talked about what CIOs need to know about their, uh, their fellow executives, how to work with them, and what to be doing if you have CIO on your career plans. It's a really good podcast. Head on over to informationweek.com to find it. Now, as for me, much of next week, I'm going to be in New Orleans at the Society for Professional Journalists annual convention, learning about lots of interesting stuff and uh, speaking on a panel about online trolls. So uh, a lot of good stuff happening in a lot of different directions, but always happy to come right back here to the good guys at Twiat. Well, there you have it, folks. That's an invitation directly from Curtis to hang out in his chat room and troll his discussion of online trolls. 
We like to be meta here on Twiet. Lou Maresca, again, senior lead developer over at Microsoft in uh, CRM Dynamics. It's it's a busy time on campus. You've got some big events coming from Microsoft. I know that you don't just get to go, but uh, it's it's got to be fun, right? Where can people find out more about you, about your company, about what you're doing? Sure. So yeah, definitely check out Microsoft Ignite. There'll be some streaming going on. It's coming out here at the end of the month. Um, it's kind of what used to be called Convergence. It's kind of the collaboration and integration of Office and in the dynamics and the ERP products and all the different. Yeah, exactly. And that'll it, it, there's be some streaming. There'll be some really cool technology, some really neat announcements, some demos from my team. Check out the uh, CRM app for Outlook. Uh, so that should be at the end of the month, I think the September 25th, 26th timeframe. Uh, but you can always find me on Twitter at Lou MM. And of course, uh, you can always find my work for, for CRM at MicrosoftCRM.com. Thanks. Lou, Curtis, thanks again. Uh, you always make this show fun. And folks, I also want to thank you, the person who stops by each and every single week to watch or to listen to our show. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. It's because of your support that Twyet has been running on four years now. And uh, well, we're showing no signs of slowing down. So we want to do a little something for you. We want to make it easier for you to get your IT information in a nice, easy, automatic, flavorable dose. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash Twyet. Once you're there, you'll find all of our back episodes. Plus, and this is important, a subscribe button. This is how you show your support for the Twyet Riot. Jump in and choose the version of your choice for your device of choice. Maybe you want to get the audio version in your iPhone so you can listen to us on your way to work. Maybe you want to get a video version on a tablet so that you can watch us at your break. Or maybe you want the high-definition video version on your Mac, your PC, your laptop, or your desktop so you can watch us in all our HD glory. It's all right there, twit.tv slash twiet. Don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out who we're going to be talking to each week, and you'll be able to suggest topics and guests for future episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Join me there, and you'll also see what I get to do when I'm not at Twit, which is mostly just messing around and wasting time. Go figure. Finally, thanks to everyone here who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leah who let us do this week at Enterprise Tech, to my fantastic, absolutely wonderful producer and co-host, Chibert. He's the guy who brings in the guests. He's the guy who makes sure that we, need what we, we have what we need in order to do the show. He's the guy who has really become Mr. Twyatt behind the scenes. And finally, to my TD, because this is the guy who pushes my buttons. He's the one who makes sure that we go out the right way. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you have a camera on yourself, but if you've got a microphone, could you tell the folks at home, uh, what is it that you actually do? Uh, I choose between standing at my desk and sitting at my desk. Other stuff, like on the computer, um, I improvise. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, as you know, anytime I'm hosting, there's always a question to the TD. And this week, it's this. And I hope you were paying attention to the episode. If you were to put three containers inside of a VM and run that VM inside of another VM that is managed by a management suite inside of a container within a third VM, how many bytes does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? IPv6? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The answer was green, but uh, you can try again next week. Kevin, thank you very <sighs> much for uh, doing your job. Greenland shark. <laughs> Folks, until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballester, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.